Hey, thank you very much for coming over for this talk, and, and thank you very much for taking your time. Um, cool. Hope you've been enjoying the, in the summit, and uh, hope um, you know, I won't keep you um, from the break soon. I'll, I'll keep it quick. Um, the one thing that I would like to start, um, start with this, I just want to give a caution. I'm not going to show any fancy graphics, or there won't be any equations, or there won't be any code base in that. So that's setting expectations for you. So I know that you've been seeing that a lot in, in, in the presentations. So this is our journey of uh, adopting Spark in an enterprise, an analytics enterprise. Um, so, I'm Rajesh Krishnan, so as introduced, I'm a senior product manager working on personalization product at EMEA. EMEA is a global enterprise. It's a B2B analytics, analytics product enterprise. And uh, we've been like around like 4,000 people roughly working across the globe from Canada, US to, to Australia. Um, the business is, um, is really data-driven. It's data-driven marketing and loyalty analytics through which we drive um, a lot of insights to our customers where they can actually um, use that insights and actually cleverly communicate with their customers to improve their loyalty. So loyalty management, we have been, uh, we've been the largest um, coalition loyalty program. We are running it in the UK and also uh, our flagship program in Canada is our plan. We do also proprietary loyalty uh, programs for various clients across the globe and the next big thing that we do is insights, loyalty, uh, loyalty analytics. So it's basically data driven. That means like we need to drive a lot of insights and we give it to the customers. And the third thing that I was telling is about the communication. We also build communication products so that the, we can communicate, our clients can communicate effectively to customers and build that one-to-one -one relationship. So on all these themes, recently, the whole thing, the, the underpinning relationship is personalization. Um, AMIA is not new to personalization, not a surprise, right? So we have been in the loyalty business, so we have to get closer to the customer. I need to understand them and their context. And what, is, what has changed in, this, in our world is the amount of data that we are receiving and how we can process it and how we can get closer to the customer and get the best, get the best output for them. And in our business, because analytics is kind of the backbone and we are doing all four types of analytics, which is trying from what. So what is, what, is it, what, is it, what is it happening? So that's a descriptive analytics and diagnostic as well. So why it has happened so that our clients can understand what's, what's the reason. And that's kind of the mainstay. And what we are also doing is predictive and prescriptive analytics. We've been good at predictive analytics so far, using a lot of advanced analytics techniques. We've been slowly emerging and getting into the prescriptive analytics, like what, what should we do if something is happening? Um, what I wanted to do here is to draw a simple uh, par you know, parallelism with equestrian sports. So I'm not sure um, how many of you guys are actually um, into horse, horse racing, betting, anyone? Cool. Uh, you know, even if you're not getting anything from my presentation, probably you will get to know something about horses. You know, I promise that. <laughs> so we have... Um, how I see, you know, I draw, I draw parallels with um, analytics to equestrian sport because there's a lot of similarities that you would see going. So we have in equestrian sports, we have like, you know, endurance racing or short race or show jumping or dressage. So these kind of things are applicable for all these kind of analytics. That's how I see it. And we, uh, in AMIA as a business, we have been in our barn, like we are doing, actually bringing a lot of horses and training a lot of horses to actually play in this arena and we build data analytics products based on that. I'm going to explain the scenario of our business and why we intended to adopt Spark. The challenge to the business is we have a really smart analytics product. It's a solution. And the solution actually is for personalizing offers for individual customers. We, we manage like roughly 3,000 offers to 6,000 offers in a, in a day and match it with uh, our customer behavior, and we do, mat we do prioritize and rank the offers for more than five million customers every single time. And we have this product, which is actually really good. 
and it is uh, doing its, its job best, faster, uh, but it is very specific, very specific in the sense like we have a single algorithm um, which is actually working to a specific retail segment. And we, what we wanted to do, the solution, we want to take this as a broader product and want to replicate this model to a lot of retailers and then make use of the, the concept. That means like we have a great challenge from making this survival instinct product into a winning habit product. That means we really have a challenge. The challenge is finding that best breed of horse to actually make it, you know, a winning horse. So we have set some objectives for ourselves when we embark on this journey. So the objectives are like really simple. So we have this award-winning concept which has the best use of customer analytics and data and loyalty awards 2014. Um, this concept, um, we want to rewrite it because so that we can productize this. And the second thing is we want to create a flexible framework around this. That means like we can add more algorithms to it whenever needed, we switch on, we switch off, and do an ensemble as well. And we wanted to also do a make this custom code into a configurable product. That means when we go to a customer, we just go and reconfigure things, and then you can we want to do a plug and play, basically. And the last thing about our objective is actually having a better performance at a lower cost. I think it is really, really key um, for us to have a better performance because of the quantum of data that we are dealing with. We, we roughly receive 20 million records a day. That's like we crunch 20 billion records roughly or two years to produce a personalization. And we also do this combination, as I said before, for roughly 6,000 offers for 5 million customers. You can calculate like 30 billion combinations we need to uh, score and rank. When it goes to the scales, performance is really, really key. We do not want to compromise anything on the performance by switching to any new technologies. Well, we are actually on a course to find that best breed of horse, which can do all these things, not just performance, just flexibility and scalability, and need the agility as well. As you all know, so we have gone through this journey to find Spark. So we have been doing this meetups in London. We go to all single, every single meetup of Spark on big data and find out what other people are doing. So how do you deal with this, this kind of problem? So everyone says Spark, and we are rookies. We had no idea what Spark was a year ago. And then we said like, oh, okay, this seems like a, it's a fabulous thing that's coming up, and we want to use it. And we do not know anything about it. So we just went ahead and we did our own research and we did our own study to get on get onto it. So this is the simple structure of the product. So we have all these customer products and transactions which we take and the algorithms get trained on them. And then every time there are offers coming up from the retailers and the audiences are set for, okay, these are the customers who are gonna ask for these offers or are we gonna send emails? So in this case, we're gonna try and at the moment when the offers arrive, so we're gonna customize and rank them for each of the single audience and then get it out. This is really simple um, in terms of the structure. So where we wanna get there with is how can we do it? So which are the key areas that's problem areas? Because of the, the data, the pre-processing, or a lot of join that's gonna happen, or the algorithm, every single thing is a pain point for us. We cannot lose performance on any of this place. And we said like, yeah, we will use Spark everywhere. Looks easy, right? So I think everyone is using that that way. Anyway, um, to, get this, to get this done, we think like, oh, okay, we can do it so easily. But it's, it's not, it, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way for certain certain environment. Why? And that is how enterprise works. When you have a lot of discovery analytics or ad hoc analytics, and when you do it for your own enterprise, which is something clearly different. You make a lot of decisions for yourselves. Now, when you actually build analytics within a product and then sell it to another bigger cl client, that you mean to be, you have to be really, really careful. They are all asking about the security. They are all asking about innovating in fast. They want to be agile. They want to be everything, but they want to be safe. That means, like, you have to be really careful in adopting any such technology. So, I want to tell you. I mean, I want to take you through this journey. And then what are the key things that you will face if you are taking uh, any of your Spark project into an enterprise product? The key things are the roles. So I'm going to again draw that, these parallels. So the owner, the owner of the horse is actually the kind of boss. You know, He has all the money. He can buy the horse and put it in the track and win the race. And really important for us is that sponsor. The sponsor needs to know what is the breed. 
So the owner needs to know what's the breed of the horse. Here, the sponsor needs to know what exactly is the technology. Although he doesn't need to work on it, but he needs to know. He needs to know what it is going to offer, how it is, how it is making his, his environment better. That's what he, he needs to know. And you need to understand the expectations of the sponsor and need to work towards it. The next is the sparksman, so which is the topic. So how every one of us here, I, I feel we are all sparksmen. Why? Because we are the people who understand the market, who understand our product, and we understand the technology, and we want to do the best. We want to get the best out of it. And we will talk about this particular guy and what he needs to do over the next few, few, few slides. And the third person who you need to be careful about is the jockey. Whatever you train about the horse, you know, it has to work on the field. And it has to win the race. And the challenges are completely different when you're from training a horse to actually put it on the field. So when you, you mean uh, here, when you, when, you, when you move a product from completely um, re-platform a product, it is very key for us to understand, go and understand who is operating this product and what are the challenges that he is facing when it's actually in, in, in operations. And you also, also ask about the, the marketing guy who's actually selling this product. You know, what are the challenges that he is facing? What is being asked by the customer? What, where, what he needs to deliver? You need to understand this guy and understand his expectations. And the last but not the least is the better. You know, every better is going to bet on the horse. He wants to win money. He wants to, win, he wants to bet on the best horse. That in this case, our clients. The clients are betting on the best products to win it. You know, to win the market for us, uh, win, a, win a market for them, and then connect with their customers better. In this journey, I actually want, want to tell you that we actually go through certain stages. The stages are really key. And it actually puts you into a certain situation where you give up, where you want to really give up some time and you don't want to do it anymore. So the first stage, what we are looking at here, is the fear. Why is it? So every time you get to a horse, you know, you get a feral horse and then ask about, okay, what do you, what do you want to train about it? Do you want to put it in an in endurance racing or you want to put it in show jumping? You need to treat that. And the horse, although it has its natural instinct of doing all these things by itself, when you want to train that, so it comes to meet, meet a human being and then it faces that fear like, what are you going to do with me? And the same thing for us. You go and talk to the horse and say like, oh my God, you need to do this, you need to do that. It doesn't, it's not going it's gonna, to, it's going to take that fear in. We need to, we need to go, we need to go through that phase. In our case, like we have to convince that the sponsor are really convinced that this is the right way. We have an existing technology which works really, really nice, really performant. There's nothing wrong about it, but performance is not the only thing that we want. We want more flexibility and more agility. And we have, and we have this new breed, so we have to work towards it. And the next stage after fear is actually the trust. When, you, when can you actually cross the fear and get to the trust stage? When you actually take this horse, and, and say like, okay, you, you put it in the right environment, get the right stable, right, right wet, get the right training, right exercise, slowly, step by step, and you can do it. In our case, how do we adopt Spark in an enterprise to do this? We have to get into the right environment. We tried a lot of things with, with, uh, while adopting. We initially put, we tried to do a lot of Spark clusters by ourselves in our virtual machines in, in our own environment. I'm, I'm no engineer. And the team that I work with is all analysts, data scientists. They do not have any specific interest in how to tune the Spark cluster. We went through a difficult period of learning how difficult it is to work in this environment. We do not want to go through it. We want to get to the next stage. We want to put Spark. We know that it is the right technology for us. We have heard about it. We understood it. And we want to go through the, this process, but without any pain. How can we do it? So we put it in the right environment. So we went to the cloud, and Databricks have been a great supporter for us uh, trying to cross that bit of it and gain trust. And the last thing is about comfort. So you have to get through this stage, and the final stage is comfort. So once you train the whole horse and then gain the trust, and the, when you will get the comfort is actually you put it on the field and, and see like whether it works. So you have to compare with the existing product and see how better it performs. That's what in our case, like you have to have the, um, the regular, the existing product that runs, and at the same time you have to run a new product in parallel to make sure that it is comfortable so that before you can move it into production. There are a few characteristics that I want to let you know um, to actually make this cross the chasm. You know, If you want to be a good sparksman, 
natural sparksman, you need to have certain characteristics. I'm again going to draw parallels with Horace. Focus. You know, any project needs focus. People say, like, oh, you need focus, focus is really key. When we replatform product, and we know that Spark as, as a technology to, to take, to adopt, it has a lot of things to offer. It has ETL, it can do a lot of streaming, it can do your analytics based algorithms. It can do a lot of things, but you have to fix really a point that you want to make a change. So you have to have a really strong focus. And you have to think unconventional. Why you need to think unwin unconventional? There'll be a lot of times like there'll be an aha moment. Oh, okay, this is how it will happen. But to get to that, you have to try a lot of different things. You know? And again, it is the same with the horse. You, know? you, you need to really understand what's going on. In the, in the mind of a horse, to, oh, okay, this is why it is thinking. So we have, to do, we have to take a different approach to get to the next step. And our classic example with Spark is like, have been rookies, right? So we haven't been doing anything nicer. So we're always dependent on someone's blog or books, or in this case, Databricks. Uh, Richard here actually helped us in saying, <laughs> um, huh, um, we had this moment of, ah, oh, we are doing this query and it is coming, the data is slow. We thought Spark is in memory. It goes everything in memory and works. No, it doesn't. Why is it not working? And so like, make sure that your data is in memory. So how do I do it? Say take one. So you put all the data, and so you say take one, the action calls, and then you get data in memory. Ah, oh, this is that simple? So that kind of an aha moment for us, you know, as rookies. And, and the third thing that I want to mention is patience. This is really a evolving technology, right? So anyone who gives up on a first resistance is not a good horseman. It's not natural horseman. As the same that goes with Spark. So a lot of things that you will face, and it will, it will break. It will give up. And you have to have that patience to actually try and do again and again and again. So it is about repeating the whole thing. Even if it is, even if it is you think that it is, why is it not working? And you have to try it again. And the fourth thing is positivity. And it will give up some time. For example, in our case, we were trying to do um, pass a lot of data in a window function, and then are kind of doing a lot of aggregations. We initially tried with small set of data, and it really worked. I said, like, fantastic, let's go for it. And then we put all the 20 billion records into it. The same, there's no change of code. And then it was like running, running, and it breaks. Running, running, and it breaks. Why it breaks? Oh, OK, there is a garbage collection issue. OK, I have no clue about it. How can we fix it? OK, I do not know. We have to change the approach. So you have to have that positivity. Every time it makes you fall down, you have to get up and start doing it. That's really important for you to take the, any Spark project into a product. And the last one is timely course correction. So I said, and, and you have to have really a lot of patience to go through it, repeat it, repeat it. But it's also really important when not to repeat it. What is the right time to break away from the repetition and change your course? So we did a lot of work in a, in a small set of data, like one month of transactions, and then with like 1,000 customers. It's fantastic, it worked. And, we, and the problems with big data is just you put all the data inside it, then it makes a big difference. It doesn't work the same way. It behaves differently. There you approach all this skewness, data skewness problem. So how, how would you shard your data? How would you partition your data so that it works right way? So you have to make sure that when you go to that big data problem, you have to change your course. You have to be prepared to actually do it again or change completely your course to make it work. So, and that's kind of really a parallelism. And the thing is, this is our setup. Simple, we have the source data and we have our enterprise data warehouse where all the complete data goes in. And then we have this Linux server. Um, I'll tell you why we had we had it in between. We put this data back into the cloud and with AWS and Databricks distribution of Spark. And then we did all of our product work, which is the, all the algorithm running, all the filters running, getting the offers ranked for each customer and getting it back. Then we put it again on the Linux server and get back to our enterprise data. This is our pre POC. Okay? We do not want to disrupt any of the things that is happening in our en enterprise data warehouse today because the engine is running, the SQL engine is running on this MPP database there. You want to just take the data out and put it in cloud and come back. I'm not sure whether you have um, attended one session before the lunch, which is from Nielsen, where the guy talked about, where Joseph talked about the Spark the hard way. They really did it within, the, uh, within their, within their on-prem uh, Spark clusters. I just, I'm just amazed. You know, I'm just probably going to learn a lot from them sooner when I, when I go for production, maybe, or we are happy probably in the cloud. Um, and there was another session yesterday evening from Ken Shu. 
um, Zach, I guess, Zach and his team. He talked about how they spark, spark the legacy, which is like turning their eight-year monolith into a Spark distributed product. That was really awesome. So I said, like, wow, few people are actually going through this, this journey before us, and it is probably not, not, it's not bad to actually be second and catching up because we learned a lot from them. In that way, I'm happy. So we had this Linux server. We had to actually mask the data. This is a problem not for the product, um, not, for the, not from the technology. It is an enterprise problem. The enterprise problem is you cannot take all the data and get it into, into cloud. And so that means like, we have to take a minimal amount of data. We have to mask the data so that it is, it's invaluable for someone else. So we have to make sure that it works in that way. And I'm really happy that this morning, Ali, in the keynote, said like, Databricks is going to provide end-to-end -end security for Dataflow. It's just going to be awesome. It's going to make my life really, really awesome. Um, so finally, the results. Um, the results, these are the achievements. We had like 80 to 80 percent, 85 percent of reduction in code base. We went from 5,000 lines to 400 lines for this proof of concept. And in terms of hardware, we used 50% less memory and kind of 20% less compute to actually achieve the same results. We had like 20% performance gain, uh, which run the previous um, product runs for a couple of hours where we get it into less than two hours somewhere. And then it's, it has obviously a lot of huge savings in the, in the cost per run. So quickly, the enablers. Spark has been the biggest enabler for to make this uh, achievement. And why we picked up is for predominantly the language of choice. We wanted to add a lot of algorithms. We want to use machine learning libraries, and it's not so easy just with our existing stack. And we wanted to actually um, use the cloud platform as well to kind of enhance and come back. So Databricks has been helping us in this case. Like they have all this, you know, you know all about the whole proposition that you have heard about a lot in, this, in these sessions. So large scale optimized clusters and we have fantastic, ah, the nice thing is about the, the visualization, the collaboration tool. So we, we can exchange our, say like, hey, how about changing this code and that code? I mean, we are happy actually looking at, yeah, I have never seen an IDE environment. I have never coded for 10 years and Spark has made me actually a programmer. Um, so it's like, you know, ah, how, how cool is this? How change that and all that stuff. So, and moving from, moving from one place, you know, just try the development and show it to the different data and you see the, the huge data working. That's really awesome. And fantastic Spark expertise, you know, getting every single step uh, has been great from Databricks. Well, can anyone tell, what is this? Oops. Is anyone who can tell what exactly is this? So this is a layout of a retail store. We are now embarking, after we finish that POC, we are embarking on new projects. And this is one of the experiment our product strategy team did. This is a retail store. And we are also, we are trying to track what a single guy who is going into the stores actually trying to do. It's entering the stores, going to a couple of aisles, going to the fourth aisle, fifth aisle, coming back. This is to understand how the user behave, you know? Oh, okay, now he is, standing there, and this guy, we know that he is, is, a, is a guy, he's visiting like third time in this, in this last two weeks, he's usually low magazines and newspapers, and he has been, not been buying it. Probably he's buying it from the local shop. So he said like, okay, let's give him an offer there. So he's opening his app, we just get a push message there, say like, okay, collect 200 bonus points, and you buy a newspaper today. So he said like, oh, what this guy does next? So he's going for some of the aisles, he's going tracing back, I have no clue why he's tracing back, okay? Yes, he goes and picks up a newspaper. Fantastic, so that means like delivering a real-time message there and actually making it work. And getting into the aisle and then exiting. So what does it mean to us? If we try to do this kind of experiments, the amount of data that we're gonna get is gonna be a lot more. So imagine this is one person tracking every single person coming in store and making their position, which aisle, what is the dwell time? It's gonna be a lot of data we need to consume and then personalize. So it's gonna be really, um, Fantastic, and I was also really interested, uh, excited, hearing yesterday's uh, Matthias message saying that, oh, we're gonna do that structured streaming, so I don't need to rewrite a lot of code, it's awesome. So, if there is one thing that I want uh, you to take away from here, it's like, this is Buck Brannaman, if anyone doesn't know, if you have seen Buck's uh, documentary. He's a great natural horseman. Um, so what he says is there is no mysticism, or no magic, or there's no one method to actually in the real name of good horsemanship. 
So it is really knowing that everything that you know will change with the very next horse. This clearly goes for any Spark projects and doing different analytics products. So, and there are a few credits I want to give because we had lived this journey without this, um, without few people, this would not have been possible. Musa is our data scientist, is the inspire, inspiration for me to actually take up Spark and make me cool. And Prasad, who's actually sharing the passion, working with me. And true less of our leadership is really key in this kind of environment. And Stuart has been, has been my boss for, for a long period. And he has let us do what we wanted to achieve. And this made us happen. And we had like John and Simon who are on senior management who helps us and going forward and taking this prototype. I, we think we'll be successful um, making this as a product. And if you follow the true horsemanship, I'm sure that you can take your enterprise um, to elsewhere and be prepared. You know, and then you give it all in and you will, you, will, you will do it for the enterprise. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, we do have a few minutes for questions. Anyone have questions for Rajesh? Cool. Going once, going oh. twice. All right. Okay. That's one there. Thanks. Oh, no, there is one. There we go. Hold on. Hi, it was a nice presentation. Thanks for that. Thank you. And my question is, how much time did it take for you guys to like complete the POC? And the second part is that you must already have some sort of solution to do the same thing already. So how fast or better is the solution compared to the last one? OK, the first question is how long it took. So we had. We tried a lot of time, like probably like three to four months in setting up a whole thing about Spark. And we, we did not have Spark engineers to work different clusters, as I said in my presentation. However, when we actually engaged, when we put Spark in the right environment, you know, using the Redbergs cloud, it's become like probably a couple of months we have finished a complete project, writing, rewriting the all algorithms and making it work. And second part of the question is like, what's the performance? Yeah, it's a 20% performance gain, even when writing the whole intermediate stages in the algorithm on disk. And in that way, we have, been, um, we have actually reduced the hardware usage compared to our existing platform. Yeah. So you mentioned that you did not have any background, or anyone in your company didn't have any background. True. Ideally, it would have been great to have some training. So this is about proving new technology, right? So big enterprises, they, when it, specifically when it comes to product, you, know, you don't want to um, change the whole existing setup and make sure that you know, there is something new technology. It works. Half the things we do not know, then no one would like to commit for it. So it's really important to make sure that there is, you go step by step. And take the really first step of like, you know, try to do it. So what we did initially, we, take, we took few queries in from this product and just run it in our Spark standalone in our laptops. It looks nice, it looked work. And then it's like, oh, okay, so we'll try like a couple of libraries, use some libraries. So our data scientists worked with uh, specific libraries. Oh, it worked. So okay, why not we do it in a big scale? So that is the kind of Spark moment for us. Like, okay, let's do it in the right way. And then we spun up like a lot of, spun up, like, lot of clusters and we failed in that case. So and Uh, we tried the hard way, like we tried four months before getting into Databricks. It took some time for us to realize we are not the Spark engineers, and it takes a lot of time to actually make that. And, but it made a single one moment to take the decision because we went to the boss and say like, oh, okay, so this is what the situation, okay? And we want to do it nicely, and we are not, we do not want to learn Spark core or, you know, how to distrib distribute uh, the data in a certain way or you know, manage the Spark cluster. We want to actually do the analytics. We want to make this product work. We want to get a configurable product out so that our business can sell it to all the retailers and make more money. And that's the case, like, you know, and then we go for like, just cloud. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh.